Welcome everyone. My name is Kim Fuller, founder and CEO of Phil. We're excited to have you with us today for this important discussion. Bienvenue à tous et à toutes, simplement pour vous aviser que la présentation sera majoritairement en anglais avec des certaines discussions en français. Sentez-vous à l'aise de nous poser vos questions dans la langue que vous préférez. La présentation sera enregistrée et disponible en ligne dans les prochains jours suite à un court sondage d'appréciation qu'on vous enverra après la session. Merci à nos partenaires et nos chers panélistes. On a hâte de vous entendre sur ce sujet chaud. We'll be taking questions as best we can during the round table, so be sure to add your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and I will do my best to give them to Hillary so the panelists can answer. We really encourage you to participate in this way so that it's as dynamic as possible. This session is meant to uh, provoke dialogue and discussion. This work began approximately two years ago, and it's very exciting to see the report publicly launched and the subject of our discussion today. We're very grateful to Sector 3 Insight for driving this portion of the project. We're looking forward to diving deeper into the topic shortly with our panelists. Big thanks to all the collaborators and partners as well to Canada Helps and PFC for hosting the webinar today. Inspired by the U.S. Center for Effective Philanthropy, who published a report called Strengthening Grantees, Foundation and Nonprofit Perspectives, they found that funders are not as in touch with nonprofits' needs as they think they are, and that both funders and nonprofits alike have a role to play in closing the gap between the support nonprofits need and the support foundations provide. The purpose of the first phase of our study is to give a basis for ongoing conversation and deeper understanding that will help the sector, the sector to mindfully or perhaps even radically renew itself. We know that uh, through COVID, we're feeling that there is a sense of urgency to rethink the way we do things. And we're hoping that this conversation will, will spark some new ideas. My colleague John and I uh, will be uh, back at the end of the session to tell you more about phase two. And the specific opportunities that we anticipate over time for this report is that perhaps fewer or same dollars delivering more positive and social, uh, and social environmental change, uh, transparent, healthy relationships between foundations and charities, a more focused effort on what matters most with increased responsiveness, resilience, and effectiveness on the, on the ground where it's needed most. You are encouraged to download and read the report prior to joining the call, so hopefully you've had a chance to review it. Um, while we won't have time to cover all the points in the report, I did want to highlight just a few. One of the findings uh, from the report underlines how dependent smaller charities are on individual donors far more than they are um, on business, government, or foundations funding. And with the number of Canadian donors in decline, this could present a problem for this group in the years to come. Lack of access to business could be uh, to businesses of business funds could also be attributed to the lack of network or maybe the lack of the businesses if the charity doesn't look established enough or if they present themselves as too grassroots. Um, we're looking to do more interviews to, to see uh, if this can be confirmed, but I have a hunch based on the work that I've been doing in the sector uh, with charities over the years that when we know that we're going after corporate funding, um, they are interested in aligning not only their values, but also having a charity that can um, give them more visibility uh, with uh, either sponsorship or other corporate partnerships that they can form. So that also affects how the smaller charities might not have access to those as the, the larger ones do. It may look in this slide that foundations are getting a bad rap on this one. Um, in the previous slide that we see that smaller organizations don't or can't access as much as others, but this question here is about why charities have not approached foundations. As a communication specialist, I know that foundations generally like to keep a low profile. Um, very few of them actually have websites for perhaps for fear of being inundated with requests. Um, but if the charity doesn't know what the foundation is interested in funding, it's a complete shot in the dark for them. So capacity is another issue that we've uh, seen that most small charities don't have the staff to fill out the grant applications, which can be lengthy or not match up with the information that the charity can offer. 
Um, and so it appears that the, the one size fits all applications doesn't necessarily fit everyone. So in this, um, in this slide, we can see that um, it, it is, it is chari it's difficult for the charities to find interested donors. Um, the main funders are not easy to deal with. Uh, and so there's a lot of question around how can we make the grant making process easier and the smaller charities don't have the skills internally to succeed at fundraising and uh, we often get approached by small charities saying how do I how do I answer these grant applications what is what do funders want to hear from me um, and uh, so they're really at a loss as to how to best fill out the applications Funders are not seen to be interested in funding charities' greatest needs. This came out um, as likely one of the most important implications of this research. It highlights the need for foundations to recognize that the highest priorities for charities are overheads, not programs, innovations, or social impact investing, or all the other stuff. Um, in my career, I've seen how exhausted charities are at like shape shifting to meet the needs of, of available funding. And often it leads to organizations stretching themselves too thin with new programming. And it's programming that sometimes can take them further away from achieving their mis mission. So this uh, to us really stood out as um, a point that is worthy of conversation. And I'm looking forward to seeing um, what what did we can hear from the panelists on this topic uh, in just a few moments. If we jump to the conclusions uh, of the survey, uh, there were six main points that were highlighted and um, a few of them are about the struggles of the smaller ones and, and also overheads, like I mentioned, um, that funders could help by being more, communica more, more communicative um, and commit to longer term multi year grants. Um, and that corporate events can be useful, but businesses should be sensitive to the work that it imposes on the charity. Um, obviously now events are, are more up in, a, in question because of COVID and um, many of those aspects will have to be rethought. I should say that um, this study was conducted uh, in October of 2019. So this was very much pre-COVID, um, but there's still so many of uh, the highlights of this report that are still valid today. Um, what COVID has shown us is that we can move faster and we can make the grant process less cumbersome. We can come together to fund things other than projects and programming. Um, but it has also shown us that the most marginalized organizations still can't access the funding they need uh, and we continue to have uh, a power issue on our hands. So we've prepared a few questions uh, for the panelists to answer and we'll take some from the audience as best we can. So now I will um, introduce uh, our moderator, uh, Hilary Pearson, who will then introduce our panelists and we can get on to the roundtable discussion. Hilary Pearson is uh, our moderator for today. She has a 20 year career in the field of foundation philanthropy in Canada. I'm sure many of you know her as the founding president of Philanthropics Foundation Canada for 18 years. She worked with many of the largest uh, private charitable foundations in the country. She's a strategic advisor and facilitator for many family foundations in their uh, work to understand the landscape, develop their goals, structure their governance and grant making processes, practices. I don't know where she finds the time, but she also is the author of numerous articles and reviews on foundation philanthropy, speaks frequently at conferences and workshops in Canada and globally. Um, in her uh, previous role at PFC, she edited uh, comprehensive guides to starting and managing foundations, as well as guides for funders working with governments, universities, in public policy development and advocacy. So clearly she's uh, very uh, well experienced and will be a fantastic moderator for us today. So Hillary, welcome. Uh, please introduce our panelists. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, very much appreciate the introduction. Uh, and uh, I should start my video. Thank you. <laughs> um, I am going to introduce the panels, uh, panelists very quickly. Uh, they all deserve a longer introduction. Uh, they are all remarkable in their own right, um, but because we have just an hour for our conversation and because 
I think we also want to leave some time for questions uh, from you, from the participants. Um, with their uh, forgiveness and permission, I will just introduce them briefly by their, their title. Um, so beginning with Marcel Lozier, who is the president, le, le président de la Fondation Lawson, et aussi uh, pour ce fin de cette conversation aujourd'hui, uh, ancien président de Imagine Canada. Donc, uh, connaît très, très bien notre secteur, le secteur communautaire, uh, des deux côtés, de, du côté des bailleurs de fonds et du côté des organismes de bienfaisance. Liliana uh, Pereza, présidente uh, de Centraide du Grand Montréal uh, et directrice générale. Liliana aussi est quelqu'un qui connaît très bien des deux côtés les fondations, les bailleurs de fonds et les organismes communautaires. Jean-Marc Mangin, euh, président de Fondation philanthropique euh, du Canada. Euh, merci Jean-Marc, euh, bienvenue. Vous aussi, vous connaissez très bien le monde de, de, euh, des bailleurs de fonds, mais surtout les fondations privées et publiques. Tasha Lachman, uh, Vice President for Philanthropy and Community at the Greater Montreal Community Foundation, la Fondation du Grand Montréal. Uh, and finally, Robin Dalton, who is president of the Cure Foundation, and the Cure Foundation is uh, an organization, perhaps unlike the other four panelists, uh, I think that Robin's organization is both a fund seeker and a fund grantor, but uh, she certainly uh, is firmly in the world of fund seekers and will be able to speak to that perspective. So we're going to be speaking uh, in either language, uh, the, the language uh, that is uh, the one of choice for the panelists. Uh, I am going to assume, you know, we are all good Canadians here that we can understand both languages. Uh, and you certainly should also feel free to ask questions in the language of your choice. So I'm going to start with a general question. And of course, it's going to be a, a question that you might want to spend a bit longer uh, each, I'm going to ask each of you to speak to this question, uh, and then we might uh, go into some more specifics um, as we move forward in the conversation. But broadly speaking, what this report is telling us is that there are issues for charities, particularly smaller charities, and I might add, uh, although this wasn't part of the questioning in the report, I think, Kim, but I would guess that it's both smaller charities and charities led by uh, people of color uh, or from uh, communities of color, uh, indigenous communities, uh, communities that generally speaking don't have the kind of access to the funder world um, that they would like to have. Uh, it'd be interesting to explore that dimension, especially given the conversation that's been going on over the past few weeks in philanthropy, both in the US and Canada. But there are three aspects of the relationship um, that clearly uh, come to the fore. Uh, it's the question of access. One could also say inclusion, access to the foundation world, the foundation community, to the funds of foundations. Sufficiency, how much, how much is available? And thirdly, conditions. Is this money being given for general operating support or is it limited only to projects and programs? These things have all come up in the answers um, that we've seen in the report. So I'm going to ask each one of you, uh, what, uh, if any, uh, surprises were there for you in this report? And does, do you find that it confirms some of your own observations? Uh, you're all very experienced. Um, what, uh, what does this uh, report tell you about the landscape? Thinking about access, about sufficiency, and about conditionality. Uh, let's start with Marcel. On commence, uh, uh, Marcel, avec toi, s'il te plaît. Um, je vais peut-être commencer avec euh, quelques mots en français. Ensuite, je vais passer à l'anglais. Mais euh, premièrement, merci. C'est vraiment une enquête très, très utile. Euh, je pense qu'on a besoin de la diffuser largement. Puis je pense que ça nous place bien pour avoir des bonnes conversations entre Fondation et OSBL. Um, one thing that hit me was, and it's similar to what I knew, but it was nice to get it reinforced, 56% of charities are small charities under 250,000. So the majority, right, are very small organizations. That connected to what the report is telling us that we're seeing the donations going down, we're going to hit, for these small organizations, it's going to be a real issue. And they will need to be able to figure out, and foundations will need 
to be able to figure out how to better connect with those very small organizations. Because if not, we're going to lose a lot of the community-based stuff on the ground, which is so important. That's number one. The second thing that hit, it's not in the report per se, but what made me think of, it made me think of the need for foundations and, and nonprofits to find the opportunities to come together. We need these forums where we can talk to each other. I've been on both sides, both on the side of nonprofit for many years and now on the foundation side. And there are a lot of assumptions on both sides that are really not helpful. And I think unless we find the forums to come together, it's going to be difficult. Donc ce besoin-là de dialogue, je pense, c'est essentiel. Pour moi, c'est les deux choses. Merci beaucoup, Marcel. Uh, effectivement. Uh, Liliane, uh, peut-être uh, on donne la parole uh, à toi. Deuxième. Merci. Merci, merci de l'invitation. Et moi, je vais parler en français. It doesn't mean I don't do not speak English, but I think it's important for, for, for me as a Montrealer to, to be speaking in French. Alors, uh, je suis un peu du même avis de, de Marcel et je pense que notre réalité COVID vient uh, mettre encore plus uh, en péril le taux de survie de ces plus petites organisations-là. Et je crois que nous avons une responsabilité collective comme écosystème de nous assurer que certaines de ces petites organisations, elles sont cruciales pour le tissu social de, notre, de nos communautés et il faut les identifier et il va falloir être proactif euh, dans des façons créatives de les appuyer soit en les en encourageant à mutualiser des services ou, ou des choses comme ça. Donc, je pense que on a un défi euh, vraiment collectif très important par rapport à ça. Euh, vous savez, les Centraides, Centraides is part of the United Way family, puis euh, notre grande euh, marque de commerce, c'est que nous, on croit fermement, profondément au financement de base, au financement à la mission. Alors, je crois que l'ensemble des, des fondations uh, Grant Makers euh, devraient euh, se re-questionner sur ça. Je pense qu'il y a un enjeu euh, important par rapport à ça et, et je crois qu'on doit être ouvert à entendre, comme Marcel vient de le dire, euh, les besoins et les, et, et les enjeux que les plus petites organisations vivent. Merci beaucoup, Liliana. Euh, je pense qu'on va poursuivre euh, peut-être avec Jean-Marc. Euh, pour euh, une, euh, une vision plus large, peut-être, de la communauté des fondations. Une vue d'ensemble. Encore merci pour euh, Kim et les, les gens pour, pour l'étude. C'est très utile. Malgré que, pour moi, je n'ai pas vu de grandes surprises. On a une communauté de petites ONG, ça confirme. On a aussi une communauté de petites fondations. La plupart n'ont pas de... On n'a pas de staff, c'est des supports de bénévolat seulement. So the, but the context in the study has also been transformed. Uh, Liliane uh, mentioned COVID, but the, the economic crisis, the struggle for, uh, against racism, uh, voting against indigenous peoples and, and black and brown people, uh, they, they are amplifying each other. And uh, we, uh, the sector is facing a tsunami, I believe, that uh, the, 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 the as a source of earned income disappears, a sense of fund, uh, traditional fundraising is much harder to do. Uh, people are left with uh, foundation funding, government funding to, to survive. And re uh, reports that are coming out from ONN, Imagine Canada, confirm the, the, both the resilience, but also the fragility in the sector. And uh, over the coming year, we're going to be uh, faced with uh, uh, significant challenges. So in, in, in that context, um, uh, PFC, uh, with the support of CFC and EFC and the Circle, issue five guiding principles uh, to uh, encourage our members to demonstrate a lot more flexibility and uh, support to pull funding arrangement, support for advocacy, yes, support for the emergency phase, but support for the long term as well. And, and uh, we have a database that's uh, uh, trying to track the level of support that's, that's uh, from, from foundation. It indicates it's been 100, about $100 million of additional grants done since March, which is encouraging, but also indicates that most of that money uh, has, has less earmarks than it did before. Uh, so, so going, going for core, core, uh, core support, but essentially with existing partners, and in the existing areas of focus of, of the foundation. So, so um, it still leaves some of the structural uh, uh, deficiencies. People are stepping up to the plate, 
uh, but it doesn't solve some of the, the, the structural issues in the, the refinery core. Indeed, yeah, and I think that the structural issues, the systemic uh, question, the uh, social injustice, I think is, is underlined by COVID and underlined even further as we go into this, further into the economic consequences of the lockdown that we're all living through. Um, Tasha, I'm gonna to turn to you now. Uh, any surprises? Does this confirm your observations of the, the community and of the fund seeking the charities, essentially? Uh, thanks, Hillary, for the question, and thanks for the organizers uh, for bringing this conversation together. I think it's really an important conversation that we're having. And I think, Kim, that you um, hit the nail on the head in your opening remarks when you said that it's about power. I think that's really the crux of this. Um, and it, it's even woven through the other comments that the panelists have made, that there is a really strong power imbalance um, between the philanthropic sector and the community organizations. And I know um, we're, the Foundation of Control is a pretty lean organization. And with all of our best intentions and with our awareness of, of thinking about equity lenses and, and different lenses in our granting, um, and especially in COVID, we are um, continuing, it's much easier to fund organizations that we know, that are known by our partners, or we can quickly check in and do a quick due diligence. Um, and it's much harder and take a lot more resources to be proactive, to go out and seek those organizations that are really moving the needle, that are providing creative solutions to these wicked social problems of our time. So I think really there is this ongoing power balance. And I think that the, uh, the report speaks to that very directly. And uh, we need to, to think about that as a sector around how we continue to address it and, and do better. I think that the COVID pandemic has, um, as Jean-Marc said, uh, created an opportunity for foundations to become more nimble uh, and to inject a lot of, of money into the, the sector, uh, at least for this period. It will be interesting to see how that plays out over a longer period of time. Um, and we are more streamlined, we're faster in our turnaround time, um, but I think a lot of what I'm seeing is that a lot of the granting is not to mission. It's still project-based related to how issues are amplified um, by COVID. Um, and I'm not sure that we're really getting to those structural, um, structural issues of, around power. I'm not sure that we're being as proactive as we could be, although we are making great efforts to be proactive, um, to seek out the organizations that are serving that are those smaller organizations. Um, and I will be very curious to see if some of those changes, some of that agility that we've shown sticks. Thanks very much, Tasha. Um, uh, we'll come back to these questions. Uh, Robin, last but not least, of course. Uh, and uh, what are your thoughts on the report? Any surprises? Uh, any further observations? Do you want to comment on what the other panelists have already said? Um, yeah, I uh, thanks thanks so much to all of you for having me here. I really appreciate uh, being a part of this wonderful group. Um, it's uh, I have to say this it's quite refreshing uh, to hear um, of the uh, importance that's being brought to bear around um, funding core um, because for especially when you think about small organizations, small charities, um, you know that they may lack the expertise in fundraising. They're small, they're grassroots, they're trying to address, as, as Tasha said, you know, these wicked social problems. The expertise that they bring to the table is to address those needs, those problems. And we kind of shifted into saying, and also you have to be a really good fundraiser. And as we know, you know, the field of fundraising has evolved so much that uh, these smaller organizations, it's, it's a lot to expect that they would have that same capacity. So um, I think uh, the position of, of the sort of bigger institutional um, granting organizations to um, uh, be aware of that and sort of uh, take a step back and, and reflect on the position of these smaller organizations is uh, is really timely as we say in this crazy period of COVID so um, yeah it's uh, it's a lot to think about I think. Well thanks Robin and so given that uh, given that there is a lot to think about and that there should be some conversations that are being stimulated in the funder community um, let me turn to Marcel and Jean-Marc for this question. 
uh, what are the conversations that are going on in the funder community? What are you hearing? Uh, what are people talking about? Clearly, uh, you've all mentioned some of the reactions and responses that uh, we've seen in the last uh, three months. Uh, some of this does go to address the concerns and the barriers that were uh, mentioned in the report by charities. Remember the report surveyed the charities. We do need still to hear from the funders. So you, you were now <laughs> being put on the spot to do that. Um, but could you both perhaps address this question? You know, what kinds of conversations are going on in the funder community around these kinds of questions and, and these barriers that have been identified? Marcel, why don't you go first? Uh, okay, merci. Alors, évidemment, Jean-Marc est <rire> davantage en contact que moi avec l'ensemble du secteur, mais si je pense un peu à ce qui se passait en 2008-2009, euh, moi, j'ai l'impression quand même assez, assez claire que les fondations sont beaucoup plus intéressées à faire partie de la solution. If I think of 2008-2009, I remember when I was at Imagine seeing a number of foundations retrench a number of foundations finding all kinds of interesting arguments to explain why they could not go into their capital for all kinds of reasons. Uh, I'm not saying that's not the case with some now, but my sense is there's a lot more solidarity. I think there's been a, a leadership change in the foundation world. Um, a lot of younger people coming in, I think, pushing the envelope in a very different way uh, than maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so that, in, that, that really encourages me. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I'm always wary when I hear that we're in a period where things have changed and we'll never go back. In 2008, 2009, many were saying that, I mean, six months after we were exactly where we were. Um, the same after so many of these issues. So I hope that there are some structural changes that really, really happen around the importance of operational funding, the importance of unrestricted funding, the importance of better relationships with grantees. I think this has started an important conversation Um, but I think we, I think we're going to need to stick to it. I think the nonprofits will need to keep our feet to the fire. Alors, on appelle à tous les OSBL de nous, <laughs> qu'on qu reste un peu là, honnête et franc dans cette conversation-là. Et puis, peut-être la dernière chose, de dire aussi que il faut qu'il y, qu y ait ce dialogue entre les deux. Je pense aussi pour que les OSBL comprennent bien les réalités des fondations et pour que les fondations connaissent bien les, les réalités des OSBL. Il n'y a pas de doute là qu'il y, y a un différentiel au niveau du pouvoir, ça c'est clair. Mais je pense qu'on ne, on, on ne peut que gagner à créer ce genre de dialogue-là, ce dialogue-là, franc, honnête, sinon ça ne sert à rien. Euh, mais j'ai quand même bon espoir, donc je suis optimiste. Nous, nous vivons euh, 30, une période de transformation pour tous. Là. Euh, mais il, il s'agit de, de, de savoir si on va se donner les, euh, les structures, les comportements pour euh, s'assurer qu'on ne retourne pas dans des patterns d'avant-crise. De, de, je pense que ça, 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 ça reste ça va savoir. Euh, mais je suis quand même... Moi, j ai, j ai, ce que je vois dans, dans le milieu, euh, des conversations où les gens... Euh, sont prêts à, à, à explorer des différents types de, 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 de comportements. Les, euh, vous avez puis des exemples concrets, c'est euh, le, le recrutement de quelques fondations pour supporter les actions communautaires dans des arrondissements dans, les plus vulnérables dans, dans Montréal euh, et euh, de, en, de, en en collaboration étroite avec euh, Centraide, avec la Croix-Rouge, avec les groupes communautaires, avec les, euh, les élus de ces, de ces arrondissements, de, 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 de financer des interventions qui, pour, euh, qui, qui, euh, qui pourront protéger la, 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 les, les groupes les plus vulnérables pour, dans, lors d'une deuxième vague et qui réalisent qu'il y a des problèmes structurels, des problèmes historiques dans ces, dans ces milieux-là, euh, qui, qui, qui doivent être également euh, être confrontés. Donc, il y a, et c est, c est, c est, cette approche, pour, ça, ça requiert une, euh, des, des conversations beaucoup plus directes avec les partenaires sur le terrain et une analyse de la situation. Euh, donc, c'est euh, des fondations qui, qui, 
à différents égards, n'étaient pas dans cet espace-là. Donc, ils apprennent beaucoup dans, dans, dans cet exercice. L'autre exercice qui, qui a été annoncé il y a, il y a, de, il y a deux jours, c'est le Indigenous People Resilience Fund, où il y, a, il, y a, il y a un financement qui est venu ensemble, qui se porte vers plusieurs fondations, euh, dont, dont celle de Marcel ici, euh, qui, qui euh, donne des ressources à des... À, à, qui sont... Qui, où la, la population, la, la, le, le, le processus décisionnel autour de ces ressources, euh, les personnes autochtones sont au cœur de ces décisions-là. Donc, les, les, euh, c'est euh, like putting your money where your mouth is, like walking the talk. There's more and more examples of that. Uh, last week, we saw the letter from um, uh, leading uh, researchers, uh, community organization, and foundation asking the Quebec government to uh, have a, a frame in, in this response and look at the 40% more poorest people in the, in the, in the province as a, the primary target of, of your the recovery response, but also have a, a, a gender lens, a racial lens, like a climate lens to, your, to, 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 to that response so we, we can make the connections. Uh, and, and, and people that, that you have foundations that are willing to, to, to accompany processes like this, Not, not, they're not foundation led, but they, they accompany and amplify this, this, this support. So, so I'm hopeful there, there are more and more examples like this. I can go from BC to, to, the, to the East Coast. Um, but the, the, the test remains to see if it's going to be these, these new behaviors are going to stay or uh, just be uh, passing through the, to, through the crisis. Thank you very much, Jean Marc. Um, I think I'd like to get more. I don't know, specific, uh, grassroots-ish. Um, I'm going to turn to Tasha and Liliana. Both of you work in uh, the community, in the community of Montreal. Um, you are community funders, and your job is to know what people in the community are thinking. Um, I know that you have set up, both of you have, uh, in your organizations, have set up uh, structures to allow you to seek and uh, listen to feedback from, directly from community. This goes to the question of communication. It also goes to the question uh, that, in fact, one of our, um, our participants has raised, which is uh, how do grassroots charities, so people really working at a very local level, um, how do they understand what funders are looking for? How do they make the connection to funders? And you know, it, that's a theme that has come up in many studies, but this report also, this survey shows it very clearly. Um, there is difficulty in making connections for grassroots charities and funders, whether those funders are private family foundations or they are community foundations or, or Centred. Although I will say that Centred and uh, the community foundation are both, because of their mandate, are already thinking about how to make connections directly into the grassroots. And they might have something to uh, share um, on that in that regard with um, private foundations. So could you both comment on this question of communication and access and how you listen to the community and how you help the community understand more about how they can access uh, foundation funds? Uh, Tasha, we'll start with you. Liana and I had to change our microphone situation. <laughs> um, at the Foundation of Greater Montreal, we are thinking really deeply about these questions. Um, and the way we work, uh, as most of you know, as a community foundation, is we manage about 650 funds. Um, and about 120 of those are, a little less, are individuals who are deciding how they're granting. So part of our job is to really make sure that each of those individuals that are granting um, are having the most impact that they could possibly have and that they're taking the time uh, once again not to only fund to the usual suspects um, at, and at the same time and understanding that those usual suspects hospitals universities research institutions are also uh, pillars of our community and and require funds but it's not the same thing as grassroots um, and then we have a certain en envelope of discretionary funding um, created by fund holders who, um, who have said, Foundation of Greater Montreal, you guys know best, do what you do. What you do. And uh, so that represents 
a moderate amount of our um, of our annual distribution. And we've been working really hard and actually over this spring and summer, the plan was to completely overhaul our whole granting and really do a deep dive and a deep consultation with the community around um, the kind of things that we're, we're talking about now. Should we be doing three to five year grants as opposed to one year grant? Should we be doing um, mission-based project uh, funding as opposed to project funding? Really understanding what gaps that we can fill in the community um, as a as a funder that aren't already filled, and of course, then COVID happened, and instead we're not doing that right now, and we're 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 working uh, <laughs> overtime to try and to try and get money out into the community in the best way that we can. Um, that being said, those conversations are are top of mind, and we um, so, so to answer the question in, in the chat, what can grassroots organizations do? I think there's to, 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 to connect with, with funders. I think that there's more and more of an understanding that um, the grassroots organizations, particularly those that are that, that are place-based, have a lot at stake. They have more at stake than we as funders do in terms of finding the solutions and living with those solutions in their communities. And so that I think as uh, local organizations, if you can show us that and show us the innovative solutions that you're bringing to the table. And innovative to me, and I think in the conversations, doesn't mean that it has to be brand new. It just means that it has to be well thought out and, um, and shown that it can really have, um, can potentially move a needle. And I think our challenge is, is to be um, proactive in, in continuing to seek out those types of relationships be open to hearing things in, in new language and language that we're, we all speak uh, around this panel, I think, a similar, whether on parle en français ou en anglais, mais our lexicon is the same. And I think when we're, we're with, uh, working with different types of organizations, maybe they don't have that same lexicon. Um, and so maybe there's a role for organizations, I know Sam Head does this, but for community foundations as well, some do in other jurisdictions, to really play an accompaniment role to certain grassroots organizations to help them um, articulate their projects better, help them to network um, and, and, uh, and play that role as well. And I know there's other private foundations, including those, some who are on this call, like Bombardier Foundation, who has a really important role in that type of, um, of training, which I think is an important role we can play as well. Um, Liliana, why don't you uh, take a crack at it? Merci, uh, Tessa. On va se complé compléter, ça, c'est sûr. Uh, je voulais juste rappeler uh, why we're Centraire and United Ways created. Well, I, I, and I'm going to do this in English, and but the rest will be in, in, in French. So, uh, Centraire in Greater Montreal was created in 1975 at the request of the business sector who did not want to receive thousands and thousands of requests from, you know, small organizations. So, we are in link with the business sector, and I can tell you it's difficult to be in link with the business sector. And very frankly, if we, our role as United Ways in Centraide is to make, is to help the grassroots organizations so that they don't have to do that. I do not, you know, wish for anyone to go through this, this quite difficult relationship, which is understandable with businesses. Uh, if, if, our, if we can help you not do that, so that you can concentrate on your role of being with people and responding to needs and doing know what doing what you know best rather than fundraising. Moi, j'aurais atteint mon objectif. Donc, juste pour rappeler que les Centraides euh, et les United Way sont à la jonction, ok, un point d'interconnexion entre les fondations privées, le milieu, euh, les institutions, euh, les villes, les autres partenaires, les euh, les entreprises et, et le monde communautaire. Et donc, euh, Centraine dans le Grand Montréal, nous, on soutient habituellement un réseau de 350 organismes. Et je dirais que notre mot d'ordre, c'est les relations continues. Alors, nous sommes en relation constante avec les organismes que nous appuyons. Uh, it's not a grantor-grantee relationship. C'est un, une relation de partenariat. Nous croyons vraiment fermement, et moi, j'ai beaucoup de gratitude et reconnaissance surtout en ce moment, envers toutes les organisations communautaires qui desservent les personnes les plus vulnérables et qui sont dans les communautés pour s'assurer 
que il n'y a pas de trou de service, that there's no gap and we leave as little people behind. Il ne faut pas en laisser trop de côté. Donc, pour nous, ça, c'est vraiment hyper important de s'assurer de rester constamment en lien. Le deuxième point, Tasha, tu en as fait allusion un peu, c'est que nous, on investit beaucoup en renforcement des capacités, développement des compétences et du leadership. Je crois que chaque fondation devrait, dans son enveloppe euh, euh, de dons ou de contributions, toujours s'assurer qu'il y a un volet de renforcement des capacités, parce que oui, les choses évoluent vite, oui, pour les organisations, juste suivre tout ce qui se passe, ce n'est pas évident, et je pense que le combo, et là je vais venir au financement de base, le combo financement de base avec un renforcement des capacités, c'est là qu'on va avoir des organisations robustes, pertinentes et qui vont pouvoir s'adapter plus aisément aux réalités qu'ils vivent. Parce que ce n'est pas évident de s'adapter. Euh, les besoins, les enjeux sont de plus en plus complexes. Hein. Tout, tout est interconnecté. Euh, L'enjeu de santé mentale, l'itinérance, la sécurité alimentaire. Donc, on ne peut plus faire les choses par silo. Il faut regarder les choses dans leur globalité. Euh, je pense que la chose qui est pour moi aussi une des choses les plus importantes, c'est la confiance. Et cette confiance-là, elle doit être réciproque. Trust. Il euh, faut que nous, on fasse comme partenaire financier, il faut qu'on fasse confiance aux organismes qu'ils savent beaucoup mieux que nous ce qu'ils font. Et eux doivent aussi nous faire confiance et nous donner un coup de fil quand ça ne va pas. C'est quand ça ne va pas qu'on appelle son meilleur ami et on lui dit ah, « j'ai un problème de gouvernance, j'ai un employé qui a été frauduleux, qu'est-ce que je dois faire? » Mais cette relation de confiance, elle se bâtit certes avant le temps, avec le temps, c'est là qu'on peut voir que les communications, Hillary, pour venir à ta question originale, est vraiment importante. Il ne faut pas être avec le bâton à dire « Ah, ben vous avez fait une erreur dans vos états financiers, on va plus vous financer. » Ça arrive à tout le monde. Donc, il faut donner tout le temps une chance au coureur d'apprendre, de se corriger. Puis après, bon, si les résultats ne sont pas là, à chaque, à chaque partenaire financier de décider ce qu'il fait. Um, puis je finirai un peu en faisant lien avec ce que Jean-Marc a dit, la question du pouvoir. Je crois qu'il faut redonner le pouvoir aux communautés. Euh, dans le monde du développement international, on parle beaucoup euh, euh, de donner le pouvoir, euh, le développement des communautés, c'est aux communautés de décider ce qu'elles qu qu veulent faire euh, dans leur environnement. Et donc, c'est comme ça que le projet d'impact collectif a vu le jour dans le Grand Montréal parce que nous avons le privilège d'avoir une infrastructure sociale qui s'appelle l'étape de quartier, qui nous permet, très honnêtement, de décentraliser les décisions. Donc, on a ce groupe de fondations avec des, des partenaires institutionnels et on a décidé de faire confiance aux tables de quartier qui ont des plans d'action et à eux de décider quelles organisations petites, moyennes ou grandes, sont en mesure de réaliser ces plans d'action locaux-là. Et c'est là que, pour moi, que les grassroots organizations devraient aller se connecter le plus rapidement possible à ces tables, ces lieux de concertation, où est-ce que vous, nous, comme partenaires financiers, on devrait investir. Alors moi, je, je suis une grande euh, euh, croyante de l'impact collectif, du développement des communautés, et ce que je me rends compte, parce que là, on en est à notre troisième année, c'est que dans un cas de crise, comme en ce moment, bien, les quartiers résilients, les quartiers qui sont, travaillent en collaboration, qui rassemblent tous les acteurs, c'est eux qui s'en se, qui sortent le mieux possible et qui peuvent répondre le mieux possible aux personnes encore plus vulnérables. Je vous dirais que ce n'est pas facile parce que la collaboration avec des fondations qui ont tous des intérêts différents, c'est un enjeu. Mais je pense qu'on est tous là. We all have the best intention and we, want, and we are trusting the local communities to decide what is best to be done. But of course, I mean, ce n'est pas naturel. Donc, on se demandait, mais c'est quoi vos critères? Puis c'est quoi le formulaire à remplir? Il n'y a pas de critères, puis il n'y a pas de formulaire. Go for it. Réalisez votre plan d'action. Faire confiance et donner du pouvoir. Voilà. Uh, merci, Liliana. Um, so that, that was an interesting example of trust-based philanthropy as Liliana was uh, discussing at the uh, Collective Impact uh, Project in Montreal. And there's more about that um, on the Centred uh, website, I think, if people are interested. Uh, 
Marcel, you might have a comment on, uh, on this question of trust and trust-based philanthropy. Just something that Liliana uh, said that, that took something for me in terms of the communications about how our, our partners also have to connect with us as foundations or as funders. And I'm following some really interesting work from colleagues in New Zealand right now, looking at rethinking what we know in the private foundation world as letters of agreement. So when we agree to fund an organization, the letter agreement goes out and we tell the organization what they need to do, right? And if they agree to all that, they sign, we sign, they get the dollars, right? And you no, know, we work with them. It's not quite as harsh, but it's that of it. And the project on which they're working, which I'm really interested in, in looking at, is, is a letter of agreement which has a mutual accountability. So this is what we're asking of you. But at the same time, as a funder, we would have to sign. We agree to be there when you need us. We agree to be there when you need to communicate something. We agree to be there to recognize your operational, so, you know, your operational needs. We're there when you need capacity building. So there is that, you know, that mutual accountability, which I think is amazing, which I think really helped change the relationship between, between organizations and foundations. Um, doesn't get rid of power entirely. I don't think anything ever will entirely, but I think this would be a really good step. So when Liana can talk about this, ça me fait penser à ce projet-là. And I'll be happy to share with others once it gets a bit more advanced. Merci beaucoup, uh, Marcel, uh, pour... Uh, uh, Larry, can I do a hot pursuit? Because, uh, I mean, Liana... Uh, then I'm going to turn to Robin because uh, Robin really hasn't had a chance to get in on on the conversation yet. So go ahead, Jean-Marc. Okay, just a, a quick a pursuit on the point that Marcel was raising. They, 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 there's good practice from the world of international development about the, the reciprocal nature of, uh, of, of a re, uh, relationship and, and uh, there's good principles of partnership that have been in place for now for nearly 15 years since the Paris, Accra and, and Busan. And so so this, uh, I'm, I'm surprised sometimes that we, in the in the first world that we have not integrated these uh, that that part of what we know is good practice elsewhere it's not it's still hard to do but it's it's it's, it's, uh, it's good practice being established elsewhere thank you and thank you for that reminder yeah um so robin uh you've been listening to all of this uh, i'm sure some of this has stimulated further thoughts in in your head but you know you also uh you see both the fund seeker perspective and the fund giver perspective. Maybe you could uh, comment a bit on some of these questions, particularly around uh, trust and you know how one establishes better relationships uh, between funders and their and the recipients of their funds, allowing for the constant uh, power imbalance. Um, thank you, Hillary. I would be uh, remiss to not uh, sort of mention I. I sometimes wear a couple of hats. I, I, I chair the board of directors of the Depot Community Food Center and NDG, who is a Sandrade funded organization. So um, I can say, uh, speak firsthand to uh, not only the, um, the incredible support uh, we felt in this time of COVID, but generally speaking, um, this uh, feeling of collaboration. Um, and I've tried to sort of uh, bring that into my other experiences. So um, at Cure Foundation, I can remember uh, when, when I started and sort of was looking into, okay, so how do we kind of build this grant granting um, agreement? And um, I remember sort of looking back on having filled out grants and getting having to be so specific with this level of data and this level of uh, reporting and going, how can, how can the, whoever it is that's requesting these funds possibly need this level of specificity? And so I've tried to um, sort of shift that and, and take, a, take a step back and say, okay, as, as the organization at the front line, this grassroots organization that's trying to achieve something important, you are the specialist in that area. Why don't you present to the foundation what it is that you're trying to achieve, how it is you think you're going to achieve it in terms of both, you know, quantitative and qualitative um, outcomes and really um, also highlight that aspect of storytelling. So from, from the, 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 the beneficiaries of the services that you're providing, you know, can you give them voice? Because ultimately, when we're talking about the, this balance of power at the end of the day, you know, this is this continuum that we're trying to uh, sort of close the loop on so that we all recognize that we have a role to play in this and um, not one single organization can achieve that uh, work without the others. Um, so when we really kind of recognize that, that importance of collaboration, um, 
um, that's where we can really, I think, get to an important place of impact. Um, and at the funders level, that is about sort of recognizing that we are we are not the only funder for all of these organizations. These, these grassroots groups are trying to, you know, jump through loops for, for um, you know, multiple uh, funding bodies with multiple requests. And, um, and I guess it's just important that we always keep that in perspective. Um, and that's why I think platforms like this, where as funders, we can kind of talk amongst ourselves and really kind of take that time to reflect is so essential. Um, because uh, processes like uh, Tasha was discussing around, you know, the importance of multi-year funding, uh, you know, rethinking all these things, you know, we do that in our silos, but I think it's also really important that we share our best practices amongst ourselves as well. Um, yeah. Thank you. Now, some great observations, Robin. Um, it's true that, of course, you know, we're missing in this conversation today, but deliberately so, uh, the government funders. Uh, and you're absolutely right to make that point, Robin. Uh, you know, many organizations are dealing with uh, government uh, grants as well as contributions from private funders. And the government can be very difficult to work with um, and in seemingly immune to these um, uh, suggestions that we are making about uh, trust-based philanthropy. Government doesn't work on the basis of trust, it seems, um, and that's that's a conundrum. So, you know, I think it's, I, I'm just going to put that question on the table, um, perhaps for a later conversation, but, you know, how can funders, uh, private funders, have the conversation with government that helps government move a little further down the road of trust-based allowing for the fact that government is structured very differently and has an accountability uh, to the public. That means that they have to be very careful about the way they disperse funds and they cannot simply hand the money over. Uh, that's understood. But there certainly can be ways of simplifying the, uh, the grant process and the requirements around that, the conditionality of those funds. Um, but perhaps, um, since we don't have any government funders at the table, Kim will fix that, I guess, at some point, right? But <laughs> since we don't have government funders, we can't have that conversation right now. Um, perhaps we could come back to um, the, I'm interested in this question of um, uh, inclusion, uh, of, of better, uh, better kind of reflection and um, feedback from people who you otherwise don't normally hear. Uh, you know, there are many voices out there that are that are excluded. And again, while the survey, I don't think really got into data that was um, analyzed by who the people were who were answering the, the questionnaire, other than by size of charity, if I understand right. I think an interesting further step would be to ask people who are answering, uh, are you are you as leaders of your organizations, are you, what is your gender? You know, what, who, who are you? Um, what, what background uh, do you come from? Because I, I see this happening in the United States. Uh, and I do think that there is an important dimension to all this, which certainly the last two or three weeks have underlined. You know, people feel excluded and they feel excluded systemically. So what do we do as funders about that? And I'm going to throw that question open uh, because a number of you are working on this uh, and you might have thoughts. Um, do you get more people onto your boards? Do you get more people onto your granting committees? Do you have more people involved in the decision making? Um, do you proactively, it sounds like some of you have proactively gone out and asked people who you don't otherwise hear from, you know, what do you need? What are you thinking? Uh, you know, how can we work together? But I'd be interested to hear from you know any of you who want to comment on this question. So, uh, <laughs> Hilary, so, uh, Jean-Marc, and and then uh, Marcel. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, you touched the actually the ill of philanthropy. We we philanthropy comes from a place of privilege, and the place of privilege does not reflect the diversity of this country. So, so what can we do about this? So the, the measures that you've, 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 uh, you've talked about, about looking at who's around the board table, looking at your process, decision-making process to get these voices in reviewing proposals so that you get the, the ref, uh, reflection coming from, from the ground up in that in part, of the, uh, in part of the process are, are, are important. It's a, it's a, it's a long-term shift. Um, at, at the, the, uh, thanks to some of the work you did uh, at PSC, uh, people 
are more comfortable in that space. But it's, uh, and first of all, on issues of gender, which is, is uh, but more, more and more on issues uh, are around in the, in the, the indigenous reconciliation, on, on uh, the, 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 the racial diversity. Uncomfortable conversation to have, but m that we must have now. And, and I, I sense that people have a greater appetite for this, for this conversation that, 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 that in the past. Um, so, so, but it, 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 uh, it, it doesn't, the, 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 when, I, when I look at my me uh, the members, we have, uh, 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 um, I think, three foundations that are, are, are led by uh, uh, women of color. And Michael Jean yesterday, uh, not with the foundation app, but made a very public statement about uh, the, the reality of systemic racism in, the, in, this, in this country. Um, these are, these are not yet in, a, in the mainstream of, of, of philanthropy, but I think what's, uh, that's what, what most members of PFC have talked to over the last year, this realization that we, we need to step up our game, that this is, is not good enough. Um, but we, so we, haven't, we haven't solved it yet. Marcel? Um. Yeah, I'm so they're sort of not an expert in this area at all, but I talk from our perspective of when we signed on to the Declaration on Reconciliation and started to work much more proactively with Indigenous communities in Northern Canada in particular. We work around the prevention of diabetes. Uh, we've learned a lot, but I remember the conversation at the board and that that's at the staff level that, of course, we needed to reach out to Indigenous leaders that could help us think this through. But even more important, not more importantly, but the really difficult part would come to our real when we would realize that we're going that we would have to work differently. Mm -hmm. And I think we can be naive about that. Um, so we can but pay lip service to the importance of diversity, et cetera. Um, but what we have learned through this, so it was great, the board was very key that, that we needed to work differently. And then we've learned a lot, which I think in some of those learnings are starting now to influence our broader granting approaches. But for me, that was the hard part mm -hmm. is you're not going to, I mean, we're very comfortable in the way we do our things. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think hopefully we're innovative and like everyone else, but we're comfortable. Um, so I, for me, that's, that's a big, big piece that, needs to, that we need to be reminded of constantly. It's going to be hard, uncomfortable, as Jean-Marc says, but I think it could lead to something really interesting. But it's hard, in my very limited experience. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's very true. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing more guides, more um, practice sharing, you know, more conversations that are specifically around this issue. Um, do any of the rest of you want to comment on this? Oui, je vais juste uh, compléter, Hillary. Um, je pense qu'il faut toujours commencer par se regarder, de faire son propre dit, hein, uh, à l'interne. Donc, nous, on est passé, à, ça fait depuis presque un an qu'on est dans un processus dans le cadre de notre politique de diversité et d'inclusion. On s'assure que toutes nos parties prenantes uh, internes uh, reflètent la composition de notre communauté en, en genre, en, en, en âge, en n'importe quoi, euh, évidemment en race et en, en diversité culturelle. Euh, puis je pense que c'est surtout les employés qui sont le plus gros push, en tout cas nous, de l'interne, euh, pour nous faire avancer. Alors nous, on est accompagnés depuis un an par, par un organisme spécialisé là-dedans pour justement changer nos biais euh, en termes de, de racisme et de discrimination systémique, s'assurer que nos équipes partout, que ce soit en collecte de fonds, que ce soit dans nos équipes d'investissement, euh, et, et je crois qu'il faut être de plus en plus proactif dans nos investissements sociaux. C'est donc être stratégique et proactif. Donc, aller sur le terrain, voir ce qui se passe, puis oui, euh, faire du reaching out aux organisations qu'on connaît moins parce qu'ils ne sont pas euh, aussi bien structurés. Euh, puis aller les encourager et les appuyer à se structurer parce qu'ils ne vont jamais avoir accès à vos fonds s'ils ne se structurent pas d'une certaine façon. Moi, je crois beaucoup aussi aux actions collectives, aux projets collectifs. On a le projet Résilience, par exemple, à, à Montréal, au Square Cabot, où est-ce que plusieurs, avec la communauté autochtone, euh, ont construit un projet collectif. Donc, il, 
Il faut le faire ensemble. Merci, Liliana. Euh, Tasha? Je pourrais en parler de ce sujet pendant très, très longtemps. Mm. Euh, je vais faire un peu de pouce sur ce qui a déjà été dit. Um, I, I love what you said, Liliana, that we have to be in the image of the community that we're serving. And I don't think that's true right now uh, of the sector in general. Um, I also liked a lot what you said, Marcel, about um, reciprocity. I don't think you used that, lang that, that language, but the idea of, of mutual learning uh, as we, we work around inclusion and diversity and doing things differently. Um, it's not inviting people to have a seat at the table. It's not even inviting people to set the table. We need to rebuild the table. Um, and I think, uh, Hillary, when you talked about some of the ideas that you had at the beginning, uh, in inclusion and diversity policies, we know that there's a huge, um, that there's a lot of tokenism that happens within organizations that we do bring a black person, an indigenous person, a person of color onto our board. And we also know that those people um, and their studies about this end up being silenced if there's not a critical mass uh, of, 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 um, of diversity around a table. Um, and, and when the rules that are set by white people are not inclusive um, to ways that, that other people might want to communicate or raise issues. So we really need to be very aware of those types of things as we're creating these policies and as we're doing our internal audits and looking in the mirror, which as uh, Liliana said, is crucial. I was at, um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately and I've been trying to dig and find these numbers. And I was at, uh, just before this meeting, actually Jean-Marc and I were both at a meeting together before this um, for, for Phil, Phil Lab, um, the advisory committee meeting. And we were talking about what types of publications we're gonna have in the coming year, um, you know, what the newsletters, what the content's gonna be. And, um, um, Tasha, do you mind explaining to people what Philab is? Yeah, yeah so everybody knows. Philab is, do, do people hear me better now? I changed my microphone situation, yeah, better. Um, so Philab is basically a, a research institution that's looking at um, issues of, of philanthropy and how philanthropy is, is responding. So they're actually studying all of these things that we're talking about and, and just issued a book. And so there's a lot of um, interesting work coming out of, 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 of that uh, institution. Um, so I asked the question, I said, you know, in, in the unit, we keep talking about inclusion and diversity, but we don't actually necessarily even have the numbers in Canada um, that could help build this case. For example, we know that in the, in, in the States, 5% of philanthropic, philanthropic dollars go to Black-led organizations, or less than 5%, which is kind of an astounding number. Um, and I, I asked this group of researchers and leaders in the philanthropic sector, do we have this number in Canada? Because I haven't been able to find it. And everyone sort of scratched their head. We don't even know as a sector if we're funding Black-led organizations, Indigenous-led organizations, women-led organizations. We don't even know. And until we have that knowledge, it's going to be really hard to make a fundamental change because those numbers, I think, will speak really, really loudly. The other thing I asked, um, and we hear about it in the States all the time, how um, Black people, for all kinds of historical reasons, are not able to amass wealth. They don't have access to mortgages. They don't have access to um, all kinds of education. And so they're not amassing wealth. And by, I think it's 2050, um, they're going to, Black people in general in America are going to have negative equity. So there's a huge gap between rich and poor. And, 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 and again, in Canada, we don't have those numbers again. And I've looked and we've, I, I just asked around that table of brilliant people and people are like, oh yeah, maybe there's some people looking into this. I, I don't know. So I think that as a sector um, and with our research institutions, we need to be pushing to have that information so that we can act accordingly. Um, okay, I, I could keep going, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, no, well, thank you very much. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more, of course, but uh, um, maybe it's a, it's a bit of a, a suggestion to you, John and uh, Kim, right, for the next part of this. Um, so do I, before we move on, um, does anybody else, Robin, you, you want to say something? Yeah, no, I just wanted to say, you know, uh, this has been such a, a special and, and reflective period and uh, as, you know, racial issues have been, have been brought to the forefront. Um, and I just hope, and I, and I am optimistic, 
that it doesn't become sort of this thing that we were talking about back in 2020. Um, and we tried our best and we sort of like checked the box and said, yeah, we, we wanted to put some things in place and then a bunch of other priorities came to the, you know, and it, it sort of fell to the wayside. I think it's really important that we really take this as a turning point moment, that now moving forward, this, this, this notion of inclusion and, and um, rebuilding the table, it becomes part of uh, our, our missions and our work. So I, I you know, it's, it's a little clean day, but I just wanted to, uh, to make sure that we, you know, take this time to really think about that. Yeah, thank you. I know I love the image, Tasha, of rebuilding the table, uh, not just resetting it, but rebuilding it entirely. And I think it goes in part to, I know there's been one question from the audience about uh, some examples of the, the tough work, the, the, the hard work that Marcel was talking about that foundations will need to do. Uh, you know, it's not simply the tokenism, but really the, the hard thinking about what it means to to have this power and to be who you are and to try and do the work you're doing um, with every good intention, um, but with these systemic questions um, that have to be dealt with. Um, there's, I think, one other question that um, people had, which, or somebody had, which was um, uh, coming back to this question of how charities and funders connect better. And there have been uh, there have been suggestions in the past about uh, trying to build, trying to use the, the magic of, of uh, databases and AI and, and other ways of sort of seeing charities uh, that uh, we, we haven't had up to now. Um, that might be one way for charities and funders to see each other um, in, a more, um, in a more comprehensive way. Um, and there's also the possibility that there could be uh, more effort made by intermediary organizations on behalf of funder, uh, on behalf of charities rather, to uh, to try and collect information about charities that they can make available um, to funders. So I don't know if anybody wants to comment on this question. And it'll be the last question I think that we have time for, uh, because I do want to wind up, leave a little bit of time at the end for. Um, a final comment from each one of you about what you've taken from this report and what you'd like to see perhaps going forward, because John Hallward at the end is going to talk to us about next steps. So just on this question of how do charities and funders connect better? How can, are there ways in which we can be more creative about helping that process? Does anybody want to comment on that? I'm putting you on the spot, I know. <laughs> yeah, Marcel? Um. Briermelich here, just got a few minutes to rest. Um, Lawson laid line counseling last year undertook what we call a grantee perception survey. Now, granted, that is not that is not understanding with the CUNY like what Liliana and Tasha do, um, but it was trying to understand what our grantees thought about how we do our work and how we can improve. And we knew, of course, that going directly to them, we'd get nothing apart from we're really nice people. We know that it's really hard, again, because of that power differential. So when we went through a third party to, and really worked really hard to show that this was going to be confidential, people could be frank, and they could actually tell us what we need to do to do a better job. And I think it worked, but only partially, because we're still, I think, too now we were still presented in too good of a light and i know there are things that we're not doing that we should you know, that we should do differently um but i think we have to start exploring with this kind of this kind of approach i think of of bring of going to grantees and potential grantees and get them to tell us very very frankly the third party is one way of doing it I'm a big fan of debating issues and what we're doing right now is great. We're essentially foundations, right? As you we were saying, Robin, and that's good. We need to talk to ourselves, but a next time would be really interesting to have half and half. And with rules that let's not be susceptible here, you know, we can say what we need to say and start having those. I mean, COVID-19 has showed us we can do virtually, right? <laughs> so much more than we thought we could do. So that would be my little suggestion of, of something that we could be looking at. Thank you. Um, well, we are uh, running uh, fine to into the last five minutes of, of the round table. So uh, I would like to ask each one of you in, in just one minute, five of you, one minute uh, to say what is one piece, one uh, 
insight, one aha, or one thought about the future um, that you have um, around this question that the report has highlighted, this question of the relationship between funders and charities in so many dimensions. So um, let's go back in reverse order. I guess, uh, Robin, I'm going to start with you. Sure. Um, I would say uh, more emphasis on funding the area of greatest needs of organizations, um, especially as we sit here as, you know, sort of the more institutional funders. Um, we should uh, be able to put ourselves in the position to understand the challenges that charities faith, uh, face, and either we want to support that work and what it takes to truly invest and become a partner um, in addressing their cause, um, or we don't. But I think whether that's, you know, putting aside uh, a portion of funding that is around um, uh, supporting the overall mission or however else that needs to kind of work, um, recognizing that um, projects and program initiatives can only be completed by strong, you know, organizations that have a, have a strong foundation. Um, that means that, you know, our role is to be uh, sort of investing in that infrastructure that allows successful projects to move forward. So really, I think that that's something uh, interesting that has come out of this work to really reflect on uh, that importance around supporting uh, the core. Thank you. Uh, Tasha? I think that we all agreed around this panel today that there were no surprises in this report, that it brought to light things that we already know. And I think these reports are really important to stimulate ongoing conversation. Um, and I think that we know what we need to do. And we know that it's hard. We know that it takes commitment. Um, but we know that we need to build better relationships. We need to be listening better. We need to be proactive. Uh, and we need to do that hard work to think about different ways of working as a, as a sector and as an organization. So I think let's commit to doing the work. Uh, Eliana. Donc moi, il y a deux choses que je trouve scandalisantes. Je vais commencer par une des celles-là. Et Mary, tu la connais bien. Um, la grande partie des capitaux philanthropiques sont placés dans des banques, dans des fonds de dotation. Um, comment faire pour que ces sommes soient accessibles aux communautés, sachant que les avantages fiscaux qu'ils ont eus ont été comblés? Donc, moi, je crois qu'il y a là un montant d'argent dormant et c'est scandaleux que ce soit le cas compte tenu des circonstances actuelles. Ça, c'est la première chose. La deuxième chose, je reviens un peu à ce que tu disais, Hillary, par rapport au gouvernement et aux données. Uh, L'argent philanthropique, c'est des peanuts par rapport à l'argent gouvernemental. Et on n'a aucune visibilité, compréhension du big picture, de où est-ce que nos gouvernements investissent leurs fonds. Euh, moi, j'ai fait l'exercice avec le gouvernement du Québec pour savoir par quartier où est-ce que la, le gouvernement du Québec, tout ministère confondu, euh, investit dans les organisations communautaires. Et ce que j'ai découvert, c'est qu'il y a trois fois plus d'argent dans des quartiers mieux nantis que dans des quartiers pauvres parce qu'on est dans du financement historique. Alors, on a vraiment un enjeu de données, de data et d'intelligence collective à construire ensemble. Donc, Centraide a débuté son projet sur lequel il rêve depuis deux ans, qui s'appelle le Radar, le Radar. I invite everybody to go on our website. It's a COVID-19 um, prototype version of capturing the nonprofits that are working on food security, finding out which ones are open or not. And I assure you, Robin, the NDG Food Depot was there. I didn't know that you were the chair, so congrats. That's an amazing organization. We're very proud to be a partner. Second thing, what are public and private funders investing? Let's make in this, uh, intelligence decisions together and make sure we do not forget the most vulnerable and those grassroots organizations through that collective intelligence. Voilà. Merci beaucoup, Liliana. Ça répond aussi à la question que j'avais posée avant aussi. Merci. Uh, Jean-Marc. Et puis après, Marcel. Je vais faire écho au commentaire de Liliane et de Tasha de, de, de Walk the Talk. Uh, so, donc, okay, il, faut faire, on, 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 il faut faire le travail. Le travail uh, uh, est, uh, est souvent difficile. Uh, il y a uh, des problèmes de données sur lesquels il faut uh, utiliser les, les, les réseaux qu'on a. Puis le réseau avec Field Lab uh, uh, est, uh, est une structure qu'on qu qu a pour les prochaines années. Il faudrait la maximifier. 
et d'avoir des systèmes comme Radar ou d'autres, d'aller mieux comprendre la réalité sur le terrain. I, 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 uh, your question about um, uh, AI as a tool, I, 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 uh, I'm not sure that's the solution. I, I, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical, but I, I, uh, there might be some potential there. I, I'm more a believer in actual deep relationship between humans than through machines, but the, the uh, so that, and, and as, as we see it in, in specific activities, that that's how you build trust-based trust -based relationship and trust-based philanthropies. People trusting each other, regardless of what's written in the proposal and the report, there's a, there's a trust of, of going on a journey together. Uh, and, and, and that uh, being, and I think that's what the moment calls for. Uh, that we we we, uh, we we need to take some risks together and and and, and trust the other parties uh, uh, to to be to be part of, of uh, and and I and, and that's what I'm I kind of there's been so many instances of people going be, over and beyond their the the, the mandate over the last three months and and and, and I, I'm quite hopeful about that it's how, how we can build these connections and these these. Uh, This, this desire for change to uh, protect each other and, and uh, that we have a, a stronger community uh, as, uh, uh, as a result. I mean, the, the next few years are going to be rough, but I think we can go through them and, and, and build, build, build something that's better than what we had before. So it's, uh, it needs a collective, uh, collective effort. And philanthropy is a piece of that. It's not the whole piece. It's a piece of that. Et moi, je vais voler, euh, rapidement voler ou emprunter peut-être, voler les sages mots de Tasha, les trois mots, euh, refaire la table, je pense que c'est ce que tu as dit, Tasha. Puis je pense à ça à toutes sortes de différents niveaux. Euh, donc moi, je retire de cette conversation plein de choses, hein, mais pour moi, refaire la table, c'est un objectif euh, louable. Merci. Well, thank you all so much for the time, the conversation, the thoughts, uh, you know, very, it's, it's, it's a fascinating conversation and I think we will have more of them. Uh, but I just want to thank you all for your honesty, your frankness and your, uh, your insight. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back over to Kim and to John Hallward. All right. So we'll just jump back into the slides here for a sec. And um, just get to our next steps. I know that we want to uh, respect everybody's time. We have about five minutes. Um, and there was also a question for John that I hope he'll be able to answer that came from uh, the audience about uh, the actual how the, the survey was done. Um, we've uh, obviously this is, is just the beginning of what we hope will be many more conversations on the topic. And um, it is the first part of a two part Uh, study that we want to be doing. We've heard from the charities and next we want to hear from the foundation. So John will speak to that in a minute. Um, we had identified a number of speaking opportunities um, and nonprofit leadership events across Canada uh, that we wanted to share these results. But obviously, as you well know, many uh, conferences have been canceled this year. So we are turning to Zoom and doing uh, as many virtual uh, um, events as we can to share this report. Um, so if you hear of anything or you want to invite us uh, to have these discussions within your groups or even within your organizations, please reach out to us. We'll be, we'll be happy to see see if we can organize something. Uh, we will be hopefully organizing more webinars in the future based on your feedback. So please answer the survey that we'll send you shortly. Um, and so um, my, jo my colleague, uh, John Howard of uh, Sector 3 is going to walk us through uh, the second part of our study. Uh, thank you, Kim. And thank you uh, foremost, I guess, to the panelists. Uh, good afternoon to everybody as well. I learned so much. I was taking notes as uh, furiously as I could. Um, and just really, uh, we're proud to have this study be part of the beginning of the conversation. I think as Marcel uh, pointed out, it needs to be a two-way dialogue. And we all um, understand that this survey is kind of a one-sided review coming from the charity side. And we have full intention as best possible to also do a survey amongst foundations um, to get their perspective, their thoughts on the grant making process and how it can be better and maybe what charities need to learn or what charities can appreciate to be better at what they do. Uh, as well, if, if funding allows, we would love to include 
businesses um, get their perspective on how they see charities in the grant making process, just because businesses also play a role in, in the sector. Um, and certainly as well, governments, although that's a little ch more challenging to get um, kind of official spokespersons of governments to be represented in a survey. Uh, there was a question I think Kim asked as well, uh, just about the nature of how we do these things. Um, in the first study with the charities, we partnered with Canada Helps because they have a database of, well, I think their full database is probably close to 17, 18, 19,000 charities. Um, so they pushed out the invitation to all of their charities. Um, as you can imagine, there's more representation of bigger charities because there's more staff and people to be represented in databases. Whereas smaller charities, there are fewer people to have the opportunity to be invited to participate. But the survey was certainly open to all the charities um, of all shapes, sizes, colors, regions, and locations. Um, and we tried to encourage them all to participate. Um, and then we did weight the data to represent the profile of small, medium, and large charities um, as re reflected by the CRA and the Charity Directorate. So we, we hope we're as inclusive as possible. Um, but it's hard to know because as somebody pointed out, we don't really know what the data is on the representation of these people. So going forward, um, I've, as I mentioned, I've taken lots of notes and we look forward to having a continuation of this conversation. And I think what we hope to do next, uh, and as kind of other suggestions come, is to find a partner to do similar research, but amongst foundation leaders. Um, and to do that, we need kind of a, a partner in two ways. One for financial support, um, because it does it cost money to host and use third party independent anonymous data collection platforms and coding and translation and that kind of stuff. And then the other part of the partnership is to get access to foundation leaders. Uh, so there are organizations like the PFC, like the Community Foundations of Canada, et cetera, that have big lists of foundations people. Um, and having those target lists gives us kind of immediate direct access. And if it comes from the president of those organizations, then the invite to participate is more likely to be opened by these people. And if we provide an anonymous third party platform, then they're more likely to feel comfortable expressing their views. Um, so we're happy to have that. And then as well for uh, point 2B, I'm sure people can read this as well as I can. Um, we're happy to have uh, some people volunteer if they like to review the draft questionnaire or to make suggestions as to what, what types of questions. Um, so for example, as I've written down, maybe a little bit about the um, ethnicity of the participants and the nature of the foundations and the charities they support. And that's certainly an area we didn't delve into um, back in October when we now discover it's more relevant to have done so, uh, particularly with the, the Black movement. Um, and if we need to, we can do some quality quants, depending on how much feedback we get as to where, uh, how comfortable we are moving forward with the next survey. And then on the next slide, um, yeah, so, we, well, we, we certainly will continue and we'd love to conduct the foundation side of the, of the survey, bring both parts together to form a two-way dialogue. As Kim mentioned, have more of these webinars and discussions, uh, ideally with governments and um, business representation as well. And then perhaps after enough time has gone by uh, to circle back and, and do a follow-up survey to see if we are making improvements as to whether the charities feel that things have improved over the last couple of years. Um, so we, we'd like to do that. And then other research may pop up, of course. So we'd love your suggestions um, talking about uh, gender-led and representation of indigenous charities and black charities and that kind of stuff. Um, maybe that's a whole other area. So anyway, enough talking from me. Thank you for participating. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, I mean, it, we, we, we all know how up in the air any kind of planning is at this time. So this is our, 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 our hope is to, to keep going and, and do the second part of the research and, and bring it back for, for an even larger conversation. Um, but um, for now, we're just really excited uh, that we had uh, a great turnout today, that it was it 
stimulated some, some interesting conversations, which we hope you will take back to each of your organizations. I want to thank again um, all of the participants and to Hillary and to our panelists, to Canada Helps, Phil, PFC, especially Sector 3 Insights for this amazing report. Um, I will be following up with emails to all of you with the final versions of the report in both French and English. And uh, there's more information on our website. Uh, socialsector.ca is a website that we've developed to just house this information and house these conversations for now. And we hope to be adding blogs, more articles from uh, various sources in Canada. We also have set up a Facebook page, which we will be doing our best to keep lively and animated. So if you have any references and you want to say something about this topic, please feel free to use this platform as a conversation tool. Uh, merci à tous pour votre uh, participation. À bientôt, j'espère. Thanks to everybody once again. Thank you.